Between Two Amps is proudly sponsored by Liquid Death. Um, you know, right now, I am enjoying a mango chainsaw. I've got some severed lime. If you don't know, they have uh, some new flavors that have come out recently. And they're amazing. They're really good. Yeah, it's it's. It, there's a little bit of agave infused agave, in there, yeah. and you know, so it really makes those those flavors pop. I'm really, yeah, I'm, I'm actually it. really stoked on. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really good. Uh, murder your thirst, by the way. Um, that's what I do daily. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I could possibly get through a podcast without murdering, murdering my thirst. thirst. I agree. I Same. mean, really, I I don't think I could riff. Yeah. Without yeah, murdering my thirst? I, I mean, I mean is, there, is there anything that you can think of that you could possibly do without murdering your thirst? No. No? No. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I can murder my thirst. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> but I murder, I definitely murder it was, a it lot was of a, songs. It was, a, it was a perfect thirst murder. Perfect to thirst murder. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Liquid Death. Appreciate it. Thank you to Liquid Death. Uh, and, and uh, uh, watch our uh, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> said watch our podcast. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> listen to our podcast. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, murder your thirst. Yep. <laughs> he was looking for a life that would give him the feeling of being worthwhile. <laughs>
works with a bluegrass semi-yodeling musician who gives guitar lessons. Mm -hmm. And I have a friend who's two years younger than me. He's got a guitar too. We got these rotten silver tone harmony, mm -hmm. just the worst. And so we take lessons together from the blue bluegrass lady. And um, we're learning G, C, and D, and we're learning to pick, strum, pick, strum, right? So we got the bass note, strum the yep. chord. And so looking at like G, strum, D, yep. you know? And then she makes us sing, which is totally embarrassing, <laughs> you know? And we're singing Coming Around the Mountain and things like that. But we're learning our basic structure. Mm -hmm. and, my, and my friend is still close friends with me, and um, he still plays great. And I always say it's a good thing he got a job and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> because if he had actually practiced as much as the rest of us, we'd all be like, going, oh, man, I can't believe that guy. And he's still <laughs> he's just naturally great, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I mean, he just bought a Soldano and had it shipped to me to save the tax, you know. <laughs> so, um, so that that's really where it starts. And of course, once you get a couple of albums and, you know, it's not like what people may know today. Um, and there's nothing wrong with this overload of information but i couldn't pick up the phone and listen to what i wanted i had to go and save up money or beg yeah. you know be it be at the store at the department store not a record shop a department store so you know my grandma's buying household goods and me and my buddy are over there like looking at the cover of the Montrose album because it's the crotch of a girl. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know? This must this album must be amazing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and so then you get a few albums and you start to develop a thing. And then the I think the real crossing point is is when you decide that you're gonna find out what all that squidly shit is. What what's all that? What's Ace Fraley doing? Boodly, 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 boodly. And then you <laughs> and then somebody shows you the box. Yep. <laughs> and you play and you play rotten bends and you and you go up and down. You don't know what a triplet is yet. And and then it just evolves and you start getting more, especially back then. Oh, I got two more records this week. So you didn't just listen to a song, you listened to it over and over and over and over and over. Yeah. And it became it's it's still I always say I'm still listening to the same 20 albums. People are like, oh, no, you gotta true. You gotta check out this band. I'm like, I don't need to check out a band. I have all the Van Halen records right here. <laughs> <laughs> like, is there do we need to fix anything? You know, like even, I have all the even Zeppelin. Hagar, Hagar era Van Halen too. I I like I separate it. That's how okay, I can okay. that's how I can get <laughs> that's how I can get there. Yeah. <laughs> I so I I just it's a whole nother entity. It is, it is. I agree. And that's especially that's when Eddie said, you know, that pop music is because it's popular, yeah. and that's when they started getting like popular. Yeah. You know, when I was a teenager and we used to go see Van Halen, it was a rowdy party. We're gonna maybe meet some girls, cop yeah. a feel, drink some <laughs> Southern Comfort. <laughs> then Van Hagar shows up. And there's no shortage of pipes on Sammy Hagar, even right now. He can sing. Oh, yeah. And yeah. So, so then we're all older. We, we can go to a bar and not just to play with a note from my mom. <laughs> He's okay to <laughs> hang out in the bar. He won't drink anything. <laughs> and, and then now housewives and, you know, 25 to 35-year-old chicks are shaking their ass to Van Hagar. Because the word, yep. yeah, because because the the word love is in every other song, <laughs> and instead of instead of David Lee Roth ain't talking about love, <laughs> you know, you know, Sammy wants to know where is love, uh, that's you true. know, or whatever, you know, and I mean, um, how will he know when it is love? Yeah, that's it. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> that's it. That's right. That's right. Now, I, I no offense, because I'm from Massachusetts originally. No offense to Gary Sharon. But we don't even have Van Halen three in this house. I, you know, I don't think I've actually ever listened to the whole no. record. Like I, I, I know I, Fire I, in I the tried. Hole, there was a video, right? 
and I've seen like live footage from around the area at the era and Eddie was playing great. Fantastic. Like, but yeah, like I, I, I that's something I at some point will need to buckle down. Revisit. Just, you gotta you gotta do it once. Yeah. <laughs> Just, if nothing else, to say I did. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny, too, because um, Brad Tolinsky just put out a book with uh, with Chris Gill called Eruption, last, you know, a few months ago last year. And um, he called me to talk about some Eddie stuff to get some timelines on the guitars right, you know, because I'm a fanatic about, like, well, he changed the neck for three weeks, you know. <laughs> And he had a piece of tape holding the knob on for two days, you know. And so he starts telling me, like, he's like, you know, I really think the overlook period is Van Halen 3. And I'm like, hello? <laughs> <laughs> I, and I love Extreme. I love Nuno. And, you know, and and Gary and Nuno were great. They were a special combination, too. You know, and um, I, th- I, f- I feel like Gary got the short end of the stick. You know, like... Yeah. It, it, you get to call you get called to play with your favorite band, you know, obviously extremes based on Van Halen. And, <laughs> and then you get there and Eddie's in in he's not even in left field. He's oh, in yeah. outer he's, he's in outer, outer space. Outer, yeah. outer space. <laughs> you know, and, that, how many cars does the guy own? He's got you know, uh, lives and he and he's you know, got he's just out of his mind. <laughs> yeah, I he saw can't, it. he can't stop playing. Piano, drums, like yeah. Oh man, I I saw. Uh, I don't I don't know what what was going on with him at, at the time, but like, have have you seen the um, Howard Stern Van Halen oh. interview? And like Eddie's kind of like bringing in like a, one of his combos and a guitar and just <laughs> like. I'm like, what is happening? Yeah, you're like, you're like guy, don't you have a guy to do this? Oh, they're like doing the, everybody else is doing an interview and, and Eddie's like checking for himself. He's like, okay, he's, he's, like, he's like, okay, I, I got my paddle. I'm good to go. You know, get my rack gear. Yeah, I, I, I encourage that with the artists. Oh, you want to move your shit? Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, here, uh, actually, we'll be dumping the truck at 10.30 a.m. Come on over. You know? <laughs> so, so going back to, like, or, so, you, so you had the, the acoustic. Obviously, right. at some point, an electric shows up. I get the Tisco electric with a silver tone amp. Ooh. Oh, cool. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's an electric guitar. Right. And I... I I, I know what a Les Paul is, and I I know what a Strat is. We we don't know what an Explorer is yet, right? So my buddy and I see Paul Stanley with this Explorer, and he's and it's he's cool, probably an A chord, <laughs> <laughs> right? Ninety three percent chance it's an A chord. Yeah. <laughs> so so we call this thing the shape. Man, if we could find the shape, it'd be great. And so he, my friend, convinces his mom to buy him a Les Paul copy. Okay. I convince my grandma to get me a Strat copy. And they're both rotten. (laughs) Plywood, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after that, my local music store has an Ibanez Les Paul with a bolt-on neck. But it's a little it's a little upgraded one. It's got the big Gibraltar bridge like an Iceman. And and it's got gold tuners and it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So I get that and that changes everything because now I have a playable assault weapon. Like (laughs) and and also at this point I meet I move on from the bluegrass teacher and I meet a guy who immediately pulls out the book page one. And I'm like, yeah, no, no, no. I said, what? dude, what I want to, I want to learn uh, this. Bay or <laughs> what? one of those books. What right? it was, Hal Leonard, it was Hal Leonard, Hal Leonard, <laughs> Melvin. You know, and, and it, you know, it's got, it, it, and it's like, this is the E string. And I'm like, I'm, 
I already know all the, the basic chords and I can hear like I can hear that I want to play this rock sound. And so I meet a guy who can show me some of that, but he still wants to do the book because you need to read. And I'm like, yeah, yeah and yeah. I still suck at reading. I, I, I can't at all. Right. I'm like, that's D sharp. I think I've heard of that, you know, <laughs> and then it goes on a while. Get the amp. Then I convinced my grandmother, I need this amp called a Marshall. And, you know, flick fracking, flick flacking back and forth. And there's a local band who play all the good stuff. Mm -hmm. They play Van Halen. They play Ario Speedwagon. They, I mean, they, they've got it all going on. And they've got Marshalls and they've got Les Pauls. Dude's got a Hamer. I mean... There and I'm on a bicycle and I, I like go sit outside and like yeah. <laughs> and then I meet them and I start taking lessons from one of the guys and I'm like, how do you know all these songs? And he goes, You just put the record on and learn it. And I was like, mm. <laughs> How do you do that? So he put on Houses of the Holy and Over Great the Hills record. and Far Away. Mm -hmm. And he showed me, hear that? That's the G chord. Oh. that's the D chord. And then he put it on another song goes, see, there's another D chord. And I'm like, oh, shit. And then all of a sudden, it, it all just clicks. I don't need a lesson. <laughs> yeah, I need I need more vinyl. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I, I get the Marshall. So I've got the Marshall 100 watt head, no master. Mm -hmm. A homemade 412. Oh, wow. Your parents were stoked, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I have the Les Paul copy. So, of course, my first move is I've read about these things called DiMarzio pickups. Because guess who's got those? Ace Fraley, baby. Yeah. <laughs> at this so, point, at this point, did Ki I think it was Ace Fraley or Paul Stanley. Didn't Gibson release a Marauder that was supposed to be like the affordable guitar? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and oddly enough, when we started upgrading our gear, my good mm -hmm. friend, um, he got a Marauder. Okay. Because it was the way to get like a Les Paul sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I held out. I don't, I don't know what I ended up getting, but I, I kept that Ibanez for a long time. And, um, I didn't know what to do with the Marshall. Mm -hmm. It was so, it's so loud. I mean, <laughs> and it was a, it, it was a six CA seven tube situation. So, uh, I didn't know what that meant back then, but that's the same tubes that Eddie had. Oh, so I've, I've got so. this, I've got this 72 Marshall. It's uncontrollable, but I'm, I, I know something's it's there. Something's there. But why does the band that I go see sound good? Because they got master volumes, right? <laughs> so lo and behold, this, this invention called the Power Soak shows up. <laughs> and many tubes and transformers later. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, I just turned the amp all the way up. And you know, I blew it up a few times. Probably I didn't know about um, it, impedance mm -hmm. or whatever. <laughs> And I also got a big muff fuzz. Mm. And so all of a sudden I had gain. And then I also had the amp gain by turning the power soak right. down. And I started to hear that tone that all the guys have. Now the next problem was, what, what do we do with this? This, <laughs> <Yeah>. is, <laughs> this is now the problem, right? <laughs> and um, so like most guys, yourselves, I'm sure, I just went and found other guys who played. Yeah. And hung around with them, whether I liked them or not, you know, yeah. and I tagged along and bothered older dudes. Yeah. Until they'd show me shit and until they'd let me play. And then I met one guy in, in a local bar band that was more like an Almond Brothers kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, they had harp and all that shit. And he started teaching me about theory. And once the once the triad thing happened in my brain, and he's going, you hear these? Uh -huh. When when Jimmy Page plays this, it's not just G. He's playing G in a D shape up here. 
And I'm like, that's, oh, yeah, your, <laughs> your, your fucking head explodes, right? <laughs> and and then, then it's like you just open it up and you just start dumping all this stuff in your head. Mm -hmm. And probably the, um, the next important thing at the same time is I sell one of my amps and I go to a used record store and I buy everything I've ever read about in Guitar Player. So I, I buy Larry Coriel, I buy Al DiMiola, Alan Holdsworth, Miles Davis, George oh, wow. Benson. I just buy all this. I don't even know if I like it. Mm -hmm. So I buy probably 80 records in one day. <laughs> and then I start going through them and, and making my own assessment. Like, I like this or I like I took me years to absorb Miles. Yeah. It would, it'd be like you'd have this cool groove. And then all of a sudden he's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is this guy playing it's a, you know and and not that i was you know perfect pitch or anything but mm -mm. sheesh jazz is tough for me to, to digest at times. well it goes by quickly too yeah you, you know and especially if you're into heavier music mm -hmm. not that jazz is, can't be heavy but no no totally you want to stay on that freaking riff you know <laughs> yeah you know, and we obviously we can't leave out, you know, once you get deeper into Black Sabbath more than Iron Man, oh, like yeah. there's, there's all kinds of stuff that comes your way from that. And and of course, yeah. you know, if we get in, you know, obviously Eddie is running the whole show at this point when I'm a teenager. And then Randy Rhodes shows up. Oh, man. <laughs> and, and then Vivian Campbell shows up with, with the first two Dio records. Oh, Jesus. So and his like his playing just still blows me. Like those first that because there's no gain, there's mm -mm. like there's right. hardly any delay or reverb, and his playing is just it, it's incredible. Like and he and I don't know if you guys have ever wa watched any of the last in line footage like that he does now, but like he nails those solos, and you're like, oh, that's every single note. He doesn't go, well, you know, I've I've advanced from then. Yeah. <laughs> No, he goes, this is the soul. <laughs> and it's perfect. It's Which perfect. Is great. Yeah, it's perfect those, just like it was then. Those first records, Dio records are awesome. Like, and you know, do you, you, do you ever notice too on the, on the drums on those two records, they're very, very dry. You're really hearing the drum resonate, not the room. You know, I was like, just gonna say, yeah, the, the production on those records, you're like, oh, these guys be almost like were so like bare bones in, in a way, like they but were yeah. playing together, yeah, but right. yeah, but <laughs> that's just that. so powerful. You're like, whoa, you know, yeah, it's oh, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, I still, yeah. you know, I would probably lose my mind if I could play with Vinny a piece, you know. <laughs> so, so it, it sounds like. Your your taste was kind of all over the place, and I I, I really because like early on, like I remember, like my my exposure into to music was, you know, the gateway at the beginning was through like my dad's record collection, and like them always kind of pushing me away from whatever I was gravitating towards, which was usually Van Halen was like the first like, oh God, what is this? um and you know and then in hardcore and punk but also like you know i'm grateful like they took me to see aldi miola and you know getting to sit it was like at a clinic in richmond virginia with 10 other people and i was sitting five feet away from him as you know this was like he was doing stuff off uh, kiss my axe and okay um, <laughs> like that that era and I, I was just like, oh, this, well, this is actually kind of cool too. Like, <laughs> so, so what? So, out of all of the um, stuff that you you went through from you know reading Guitar Player, like what what kind of resonated the most with you out of that? Well, the, the outside of the the metal and hard rock that we were getting back then, because obviously. I was into Maiden, Priest, Sabbath. That's um, the golden age right there. <laughs> yeah, that's where the, it's the it's where the building blocks are. Yeah, there, yeah. right. You know, because Sabbath lays the foundation, and then the other two bands come up, and they you know they built they put the next totally. level on, totally. and and you know, and of course, I'm in a small town in Massachusetts, 
and we've got a couple of cool bands, a lot of good musicians. Um, but we don't, you know, where do you where do you buy these clothes for one thing, right? <laughs> Second thing, I've got this picture of Rob Halford in the full gear. And I'm like, where do you get this shit, right? And <laughs> yeah. And so didn't have any bondage stores or <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we, we didn't have a bondage store yet. And uh I think there's one there now though. And <laughs> so meanwhile, I've got these other records and I'm reading about these guys and I'm also reading about my guys liking those guys. Mm. So I'm reading Eddie or Neil Sean or saying, you know, oh, I'm into this Holdsworth guy. And then I meet this drummer who plays fusion and he's got the kit with the full the, thing, the full uh, oct octopus, right? All eight toms. <laughs> They're Vista lights. So you can see through them. He's got awesome. China symbols, you know, and he's playing double bass. And we're not yet at the double bass era of. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Double bass just shows up in as a, an, an effect, you know, mm -hmm. and. He gives me this record called Enigmatic Ocean by Jean-Luc Pawnee, and which features a teenage Steve Smith on drums, a teenage uh, Ralph Armstrong on bass, um, and Daryl Sturmer from... Uh, 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 Phil Collins. Or yeah, yeah, Genesis. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Genesis. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right? And then Holdsworth. And of course, Jean-Luc's ripping on the thing. This album just... It has it has heavy parts, jazzy parts, funky parts, jamming parts, and <clears throat> this blows my mind. Another, and then the guy goes, "Oh, you want to hear something even more mind blowing? Listen to this record. This is called the Mahavishnu Orchestra." Oh and man! Then, then I'm <laughs> then I'm destroyed because you know how McLaughlin is so nasty on that first record. It's so. At any point, he could play rotten, you know? That's how far he's mm -hmm. pushing. He's pushing and pushing. And Cobham is just... And so these two these two albums, Intermounting Flame and Enigmatic Ocean, make me start wanting to be more than in a blues band. Yeah. Because I get I get to play with my, my teacher's blues band. And we play Cocaine. And we play One Way Out by the Allman Brothers. And we take mm -hmm. eight-minute solos that suck you know <laughs> <laughs> and and so i start studying more and taking more of a, a a methodical approach and learning scales and starting to understand these chords and stuff and so then of course start having bands and um I, I get I you know I get I get my henchmen together who are cool in high school and I'm like dude we should you know do this mm -hmm. and this you know I get my one friend uh, who's a successful film composer now and you know Grammy nominated and stuff I won't name him I don't want him embarrassed <laughs> by, by me uh, but he's got a banjo and I'm like dude get rid of that thing <laughs> get a guitar. <laughs> So he gets like a, an SG copy, you know, and I'm like, I'm like, this is E, right? <laughs> this is D, you know? And uh, <clears throat> so him and I, we start going down that, you know, that road of Priest and Van Halen, trying to have a band like that and dressing up, growing our hair finally, you know, get an earring. Nice. You know, all, all radical shit for 1980, <laughs> 81. Where, where did you run the earring in your signal chain? Is that, you know? That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, well, I run it before the mouth into the. <laughs> got it, got it, got it. Okay. <laughs> and so uh, he and I, we also uh, start. I start teaching as a teenager too. Mm. And yeah. I'm not. I'm not really a good teacher. I don't even know much, but I can make five bucks at a lesson. You know. So I start teaching some other dudes who are like mm. twelve, or thirteen, and I start teaching a couple adults too, which is you know at the local shop. And we start buying cool guitars. So I, at this point, I buy a Dean ML. Oh wow! Oh okay. So, well, so what? What year was it? Eighty one. Eighty one. Nice. So my, my grandmother bought it, mm -hmm. and uh, but it was planned, and I bought it because I wanted a Hamer, like the guy in the cool band. But you couldn't get a Hamer that easily, 
special order, da da da. Right. So they're I'm a German at, company, aren't they? No, uh, they're Chicago, right? Oh, they're Chicago. 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 Oh, really? Okay. And so I get the Dean ML, which is close enough. Cause, cause I meet, I meet a guy at a, at a school dance in the band and he's a guitar dealer. Oh, you don't want a hammer. You want to buy a Dean. <laughs> and he's got the catalog like in his, like, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, I get that guitar and then, you know, then my buddy orders a Charvel and with a Floyd. Yeah. Then our minds are blown again. So I order a Charvel. So, oh, mm-hmm. so was that with the original Floyd or the like without the fine tuners or what? Yes, had the without fine the tuners, no tuners. Oh, oh wow! God. And they were great. Oh. And here's the irony: is I, I don't have the Dean. I sold that to Dimebag many years later because mm-hmm. I'm not. After I heard him play, I wasn't going to go show up with a Dean. <laughs> <laughs> and but I, I own the Charvel from my buddy. I own the Charvel I bought, yeah. mm-hmm. and uh oh man hey, there's and i own the hammer oh Ooh. the thing is gorgeous right that's this is the one from oh, my friend sh- when i was a kid <laughs> it took me 30 something years to buy it that thing looks insane what what year is that one um this is a 1980 uh, uh and, and for those on the pod we're looking at a, a unobtainium gorgeous burst Hammer Explorer. Yeah. I'm guessing those are those uh, Marzios Marzios? Or... yeah, stock to Marzios, PAFs. Mm. And I, I bothered this guy for years. And, <laughs> and he didn't he didn't need my money or anything. And one day I, I had I had some friends come to a show and they bring me a note. And it said, Hey Mike, here's my number. I'm ready to sell the hammer. And I'm, I'm like frantic because I've like just paid quarterly taxes. I don't have, <laughs> I don't have any money. <clears throat> so I I go straight immediately. I go to Bonamassa's dressing room and I'm like, hey, man, can I borrow like five or six grand right now? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, what, what's going on? I'm like, you know that hammer I told you about? He's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so he's he's like, I'll finance that. Yeah. And, so I paid him back though, and, uh, and of course then I bought more. But um, yeah, right. But but the irony is I I have all these guitars uh, from then, mm-hmm. these first instruments, my buddies that were my friends' guitars. I have a guitar that belonged to the guy who sold me the Dean, as well. <laughs> and oh wow! And actually, I have a bunch of guitars. That's that should be my focus on collecting, only guitars of people I know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I have I have a couple basses that were friends of mine too, you know, mm-hmm. like their main instrument, not just um they owned it, you know, like yeah. I could I could sell you one of these turds over here and it's it's only owned by me. It's not played like something like my guitar, you know. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Were you pointing at the Holdsworths and calling them turds or <laughs> 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 oh, those are good <laughs> actually this is this is actually let's let's get a definition of what a turd is <laughs> well a, a turd's anything you can't sell god so or or uh that that the term turds for me uh i have a great friend down in the boston area and we we just we we overbuy, we overpay, and then when we need money, we got to sell shit and we lose money. So we call them turds because of that, you know. And, <laughs> um, I, I I've focused my turds to be better than normal though. <laughs> so that's why yeah. I have a, I have a thing about selling gear when I need money. It's just like I know every time I do it, it's just gonna bite me in the ass. Like I'm, I, so, I'm so waiting, much- I'm waiting until my wife doesn't have a job. <laughs> <laughs> because i've <laughs> i've sold so i could actually gear. see the look coming from off camera <laughs> yeah. yeah thankfully like... she's in the other she's in the other <laughs> wing of the mcmansion but oh. <laughs> um so i digress <laughs> so so you're in massachusetts so what like at what point do you 
end up? Because like, where where does the um, thing pick up? Because did did that happen in Los Angeles or? or? Yeah, well, I, I ended up going to Berkeley, mm-hmm. and one of my main cohorts there was Derek Sherinian, the you know yeah. the world's greatest rock keyboardist, <laughs> <laughs> and so he and I were mega Van Halen freaks. Mega Randy Rhodes freaks. We love Holdsworth. Mm-hmm. We we love Jeff Beck. We love Ingve because Ingve is just coming out. Oh yeah, at that point right. And we're like, oh shit. <laughs> yeah, and we got to get puffy shirts now. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and and you know we're also we're in my class of people at Berkeley, a group of dropouts. Uh, Al Petrelli, who's an, another fantastic guitar player. And we, all of a sudden, we just like, what are we doing here? Let's go to LA. Like, why are we in school? Like, <laughs> we should be, we should be in the music Blank. business, right? Let's go rock. So, so we end up in Hollywood and um, banging around town, mostly partying. Me, mm-hmm. you know, other uh, some, my other friends, but like four or five of us all moved. We lived in the same building. We, I mean, we really like went in there. But the one thing we did wrong, or in my opinion, is we didn't form a group together and stay together uh-huh. musically. We all went to get a gig, right? Got it. So I end up meeting this lady at a gig or a party, and she's a manager. And we hit it off. She's super cool. And so she starts trying to help me get gigs. And I end up auditioning for several L.A. bands of questionable outfits um you know uh, well, I, I think that's just of the time of the time, of the time. yeah and, and you know as you guys know you can go there with the business plan which i didn't have any plan other than let's get wasted and <laughs> um basically you run into people at a party so yeah. you know I end up, I'm at a party and I meet this guy and he plays drums for this band, LA Guns, who, whoever that is at, at the time. Mm-hmm. And so we, we meet, we're at a, at a building party, not a house party, but like a whole building is a faster pussycat or playing in the basement. Damn. And, <laughs> and you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's raucous. And mm-hmm. so we, we we're, we're up late that night and he's like, dude, what are, he's in my apartment and he sees the guitars. He's like, oh, yeah, man, I got a band. They're called L.A. Guns. You should come jam. So I go down and jam with them. And it, it's pretty fun, you know. Mm-hmm. And then it's down to, yeah, man, I'd like you to play in the band. I'm like, this would be great. Yeah, I like you guys. Drinking booze. There's chicks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you got to dye your hair black. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> So this is all while Tracy Guns is estranged from them. Okay. So a few years ago, I meet Tracy and I tell him the story. He's like, "I never heard that story." And I'm like, "I don't <laughs> think I don't think you were on talking terms then, you know." <laughs> and so I, I just went around. I read the Music Connection magazine. I auditioned for some people, and it didn't. Nothing panned out. Mm-hmm. And this woman gets me this. She's like, "I've got a band for you. They're in England, and they're called Venom." And I'm like, "Venom? I know that name." And I remembered seeing at the Palladium Venom and Slayer when I was walking to work on Hollywood Boulevard. Mm-hmm. I and thought you were talking about the Palladium in Worcester because I used to live in, I used well, to play in Massachusetts uh, a lot. I bet I've been there a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's like the, well, it's really the epicenter of metal in the United States. It's totally. Far as I, I mean, I've played so many, I, I was able to share the stage with Motorhead at that, at that thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. Fuck. <laughs> Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great venue. I started going there when I, before I drove. My dad would take me there. <laughs> you know, I went to see Triumph there oh, in, oh, in, wow. in 19, 1981 or something. Uh-huh. My dad used to be forced, you know, the chauffeur. <laughs> you know, so, so he saw Kiss twice, you know. Nice. And, and uh, Tall, Uriah Heep, you know, uh, Aerosmith. He mm-hmm. went to a bunch of cool shows. He didn't think so, but... <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so the lady, the lady, she's got my cassette tape, and and she's also what I do recall now. Um, she was trying to find a singer for this band Pantera at the time, 
<laughs> oh wow <laughs> which is really weird you know because so later would be the this would be the era that Pantera was like a hair metal band. Right. So this this would have been just before power metal came out? Probably. It, yeah. it would have been 1985-ish. Okay. Yeah. Uh, early, early 86. And um, I don't know that she connected them with Phil or anything. Right. Um, and I never even thought ever in my life to mention it to him because it didn't cross my mind. But uh, so uh, my roommate and I, we rent the Venom home video on VHS up at tower records nice and we watch it and we're like looking at each other going what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> and and i'm looking at the show and chronos is red boots and and all the all Hell, and all the yeah. all this yeah <laughs> and i'm like oh, this, this looks like fun and i wanted to get out of there i wanted a gig uh-huh and I'm like, wow, these guys are from England, man. Wow. Kerrang magazine. Oh, shit. So <laughs> I fly over there. I don't ask about the pay. Mm -hmm. I don't ask anything. I just get a passport, which I never had. And I take a guitar and a, and a duffel bag or something. And I fly to England. And I get there. We start drinking. <laughs> When are we going to jam? Oh, we're going to we'll jam in a few days. All right, when you know, and so I'm there with Abaddon, right? And the and the and the other guitar player, Jim Clare, also known as Jimmy C, right? <laughs> and um, so I get I get pawned off living with him. We're hanging out four or five days. I'm there. We haven't even played a note except for. <laughs> except for Jim and I in the apartment, you know? Mm -hmm. And then finally we go and rehearse and it's like so fucking loud. And, <laughs> and you know, Kronos's bass is like this, at the time he had an acoustic 220, which he came out of into an H and H like PA head for just his, <laughs> just for the horn in his <laughs> cabinets. <laughs> so he had a horn and two 15s. And it was like this grating, rotten metal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was glorious. I was like, yeah, wow. I, I love his tone. His tone. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, he's he's overlooked uh, probably by his own fault. But people, like, they always say Venom, oh, they don't sound good. The recordings aren't good. That This ain't good. There's a lot going on there. They're scrappy. There's the punk influence. Oh, yeah. For they're... sure. You know, the red, the red yeah. docks are your first hint, yep. right? The rolled up jeans are your yep. second hint. <laughs> and th these guys aren't like you and I, where we grew up and had our nice bicycle and we went mm -hmm. into, you know, hang out. And our parents bought us a nice acoustic, yeah. you know, <laughs> took us to our left. These are three, th three rogues, three young thugs from the streets <laughs> of Newcastle. And here I am, you know, the, the green one. You know, yeah, I want to, I want to play heavy metal guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I get, we get to the thing and the guy and they go, Hey man, play flight of the bumblebee. And I'm like, you play flight of the, I don't know. Flight of the bumblebee. What are you talking about? And so basically on the cassette, there was me and several other guitar players. My songs were from me and Sherinian jamming this bad metal fusion. <laughs> With funky bass <laughs> the song before it is some guy ripping flight of the bumblebee <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> as much as i'd like to apologize for him for not getting the venom gig i'd also like to refer him to my lawyer fees <laughs> and <laughs> i i and, just want to just want to highlight the fact that <laughs> the thing that got <laughs> I, the thing that got Venom's attention was Flight of the Bumblebee. <laughs> it's because, it, and it's it's because it's because you know, like Mantis was very, Mantis was very kind of a, uh, like a lot right, of like it, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a kind of kind of a priesty maidenly kind of player, and and a lot of dive bombs and shit, and then you know they hear this thing. <laughs> 
which I hate the sound of that, but <laughs> apparently, you know, it's kind of like it was something shiny to them. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so I'm already in England. They're stuck with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they got the wrong dude. Yeah, they got the wrong dude. And I, 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 I've said that every time I've gone to play there, too. And, <laughs> uh, and so, you know, we we just learned to make the best of it really quickly. And plus, um, you know, they were trying at that time, they were trying to broaden the sound of the band. Uh, I'm sure people want to blame it on Jim and I for bringing in some outside influence, but they wanted to have vocal harmony. They wanted to have twin guitar. Mm -hmm. They wanted to get away from Satan you know, as the, uh, you know, and, and I'm a firm believer as, as a Venom fan, you know, I became a Venom fan by being in the band. Mm -hmm. uh, the first three albums, that's it. They should have just fucking stopped. Okay. <laughs> don't, don't hire me. You know, just th th that was a perfect trilogy. Trilogy. Of destruction, you know. And, uh, of course, you know, years later, I finally meet Mantis and, uh, you know, I've learned all his riffs, mm -hmm. you know, I have to shake them off, you know, and I, the, the problem with the, that band being, being in, so influential and all those classic compositions, they didn't want to play live. They thought every time you played live, it had to be the 4th of July or something, right? <laughs> And I knew you got to go play in the clubs to then, oh, yeah. move, then you move to the theater, <laughs> then you move to the arena, and then hopefully you stay there long enough to get your pension. And, <laughs> right. And so we didn't, you know, I was in the band a couple of years and we did like seven shows. And I was oh, like, wow, are we just going to sit here? And That's crazy. Yeah, it was. And it was a, a real waste of uh, the, potential mm -hmm. you know and then of course abaddon left so it was just you know chronos and i are just like well i'm like dude i know drummers mm -hmm. like i know badass drummers you know <clears throat> and um and abaddon has a thing he does and it works in that box <laughs> but you're not going to bring him in and go hey man we're going to do a funk jam later you know <laughs> Come on in, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah or yeah. oh, this one's a King Crimson style thing, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Kronos and I, we 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 kept Jim on guitar, and we got an American drummer, and then we took what would have been the next Venom record, and we, you know, finalized those songs that became "Dancing in the Fire," mm -hmm. which slips off everyone's tongue. Because so many people heard it, and <laughs> <laughs> I like, I, say, like I, calm before the storm. Like I, I genuinely like. Like I, I don't understand. Uh, I... <laughs> and so I think. Oh, then it's a major seven chord in the death note. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Oh. Yep. Yeah, exactly. but Calm's Calm's got see now Calm was the record they were working on with Mantis, which would have been called Deadline. And okay. on the record, there's a song called Deadline. And um, so I think Jim co-wrote one song on there or two. I didn't write anything. I just did as many whammy bar things because I was obsessed with Steve Vai and pulling harmonics. And, um, and, you know, Jim and I were pretty good. Uh, we had a healthy, friendly competition. And he he plays totally like he would write a beautiful solo. Mm -hmm. And then I'd go in and I'd just play anything. Yeah. You know? and, <laughs> and my excuse was I was improvising. Yeah, you're fine. <laughs> 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 you know and uh that album could have done a lot if they wanted to play live you know but yeah. but but also you think about uh, any band in that genre 
I could use Celtic Frost as an example. Mm-hmm. Remember they 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 changed their hairstyle a little bit for an album. Yeah. yeah. And all of a sudden, everybody was like, "Yeah." <laughs> and I I feel like the Venom fans. First of all, Venom is already having a tough time because Kerrang wants to fuck with them and Metal Hammer, and you know, and then they bring us two in and we start dressing with ze- uh, zebra prints and leopard print <laughs> and and um there was nowhere to go with it the fans went away because we're not going to play seven gates of hell i mean we're going to play it but yeah it's not what we're playing is nothing like that <clears throat> and i mean you just i i was too young to actually be able to make a decision on that stuff because you know obviously looking back i'm like we should have got twice as many spikes and you know <laughs> and, and upside down cross earrings and we yeah, you know, yeah. should have peeled skin off live humans yeah. you know <laughs> you know and so so it, it falls apart and we do the chronos thing but there's no money in chronos and i live here he lives mm-hmm. there there's the flying back and forth and at that time you know an airplane ticket to us was so much money it wasn't just part of the business it was right oh we yeah were, we weren't businessmen we were just metal guys <laughs> oh you, you want to play all right yeah we could have practice today yeah dude, yeah, <laughs> dude yeah dude i'll be over man you guys got any brown ale i'll be right <laughs> over right you know? and so but the, the one thing i'll say is Kronos and i always kept it going you know we always kept trying to do something and I eventually just was like, well, I ended up going and being a roadie because that was an opportunity to be part of the metal scene. Mm-hmm. And also I had no job. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just a guitar bum, you know? And, <laughs> and I mean, it's just, I don't have a job now. You know? <laughs> it's, it's great. I get, I get to reinvent myself every 10 years, you know? <laughs> So, so what kind of gear, like what, so you go over for like with your guitar, like, was it just what they had there that you were playing with for, for Venom? Yeah. Well, once I, we realized I was staying like, and that I couldn't really fly to the Bumblebee, uh, <laughs> we flew my Marshall over from LA. Oh, wow. And so I had my, I had a 50 watt Plexi. Which you know yeah. was great for soloing. It wasn't so good for the the heavy the rhythm. rhythm. Yeah, <laughs> but this this stuff wasn't. In, we weren't thinking that way yet, right? Yeah. So and we we're just getting hip to the Metallica tones. At least I am, and um, and the Anthrax tones with that JCM boosted, right. and uh, so I used the I used the Plexi on Calm. And that's why some of the rhythm is kind of, to me, it's like nasally and whatever. And the solos sound fine, except for the notes. But, and uh, then we get a couple of JCMs. Jimmy C gets into the Galleon Kruger, the little oh. M- ML, 250 ML, the little tiny thing. And he likes solid state. He likes stereo chorus. And I'm the other guy. And so yeah, how we, does that pair up? <laughs> it it ended up being okay, but it was very like that sound was that sound, and this side of the stage was me and Kronos. Right. It's like which band do you want to listen to? Yeah. <laughs> stage yeah. After, stage right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You want you want to hear these two guys or that jerk, you know? <laughs> and um when we when we came to America as Kronos. I still had the Plexi. I had two Plexis, and I borrowed some gear from my friends for Jim and for Kronos. So I borrowed an acoustic bass amp for him, and I borrowed some Bedrock amps, um, which were made in New Hampshire. And then we used those. And I think the last time I recorded with that lineup of people, which is a long time ago now, we had a plexi 
an 800 and a 900 and yeah. you know and and whatever maybe right. a, a super overdrive or something in front um we weren't necessarily good at getting a special tone at the time like i'm i'm way more advanced at it now and it's still <laughs> just ba it now it's still basically one cable is the real <laughs> trick into the amp and right. um but I don't think we ever got our sonic palette together. And, uh, you know, we were good at growing our hair long and being wild. And, and not dying it. <laughs> and not, well, Kronos, yeah, he was born with blood red hair, you know. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, I don't think I really started getting toned together until Carcass. You know, because we had the 5150 show up. And I, I used Mike Amott's JCM 900 for a little while at rehearsals. So that was kind of, that started leading into that more chewy low end. And I, I started thinking more about that than lead, you know, playing, playing rhythm, you know, getting, getting a better metal rhythm sound because there, you know, uh, uh, the, that era is where those those tones start really taking shape right for a lot so, of bands so and and you're yeah. talking now on, on carcass uh, yeah I, i'm I sorry assume. to vacillate yeah, yeah yeah yeah. so when who was the other guitar player when you were in the band was it bill steer or yeah okay yeah so so, so uh i'm still doing chronos you know by mail sending cassettes and you know <laughs> it's horrible and <clears throat> and we do a the couple original records. dropbox <laughs> yes yeah it, ju it just takes like 11 days you know and uh <clears throat> so my buddy gets called he was going to go on this tour and he gets called to go on a better tour and i basically he was going to go out and tech for brutal truth and his brother's a big merch guy so he got to go on the Aussie tour. Oh wow. And, and, and sell t-shirts. Oh. Which is probably better than being on the crew. And yeah, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> he says, Hey man, you want to do this thing? It's with brutal truth. You know those guys from nuclear assault and shit. And I'm like, Oh yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, and I think it was like, you know, the pay was like 175 bucks, and I had to drive the van. <laughs> And they spring all this shit on me when I get there, you know, like, oh, and you got to take, of care of these, you know, this yeah. cathedral is this, this is carcass. And I'm like, and then they start playing and I've never heard of these guys. Right. I've read about them, but I'm, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's like, Argh! and I was like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm, cause I'm a nuclear assault fan. But then Danny uh -huh. Lilker is playing with this yeah. th this monster on vocals, Kevin Sharp, um, who I love, and I'm I'm shocked. He's singing through a rap pedal. Like oh, I didn't realize he did that. I didn't realize that. Not all the yeah. time. Not all the time, because yeah. you know it would be a problem. But that the, there was but a any time. Pedal. That's that's amazing. <laughs> and, and so I'm overloaded with this. Then Cathedral come out and they're so slow. And I'm like, oh my God, this song's taking forever. And <laughs> then then Carcass come on. This is all the first day. Carcass come on. <laughs> and they start playing lead. And I'm like, oh shit, I like these guys. These are my guys, <laughs> you know? And so we do like 40 something shows and I'm driving in the van and, you know, yip yapping. And somewhere along the line, <clears throat> uh barney from napalm he comes up and he's like ha, 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 you're from fucking venom mate right? <laughs> so he they, they, put, they put it together they put it together <laughs> and um so i get nicknamed micus like mantis right <laughs> and they'll all they'll all still call me that to this day and uh so the bass player in Cathedral gets in a tiff with Lee Dorian or whoever or Gaz, and he's like, I'm quitting. And they're like, fuck, we've got, like, they're about to get signed to Sony. 
you know, that whole earache thing's about to happen for all those yeah, bands. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, I'm out of here. So I said, hey, I, I, they're like, what are we going to do? I said, I'll, I'll play bass, man. It's cool. It's no problem. So, oh, great idea. We'll get Micus, you know. <laughs> and, <laughs> so we do it. And I keep doing it. Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, I'm using this journey to Coventry, England. Oh, I got the weekend off. I'm going to drive up and work with Kronos. So I'm letting <laughs> I'm letting the Cathedral Tour pay for my flights to England so I can zip over and work on some Kronos material. And so we tour and tour and tour, and it's great. And we end up years later, you know, uh, we, we steal the drummer from Cathedral, Mark Ramsey Wharton, okay. to play with Kronos. And the album never got released, but we did a whole album with him. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, if you read the Kronos version of the story, is he found Mark Ramsey Wharton. Not that I toured <laughs> with him for nine months, you know, <laughs> it, as a rhythm section, you know, great drummer. <laughs> And I was just getting sick of playing bass. Not that I hate it. I love bass, but I wanted to play lead and I wanted to work on chrono songs. And so I, I said, guys, can we just, you know, can you get a bass player? So they, they got Scott Carlson from Repulsion. Oh, yeah. I and he's, he's great. And he's a great dude. And so that's all cool. We're all cool. I'm not quitting because I hate them or anything. And uh, I'm home for a few months and I get a CD from Carcass in the mail. And it's heart work. And I'm, I'm like, I put it in. I'm like, oh, shit. This is it right here. And I'm like, <laughs> I bet they're going to go on tour. Man, maybe I can, you know, go out and tech for them. That'd be great, right? So the manager calls me. He's like, hey, can you come on tour with us? I'm like, yeah, dude, I can't wait. The album sounds great. Good job, you know? And he's like, can you play guitar? And I'm like, what, me? And he's like, <laughs> he's like well, Amot's out. And I'm like, Amot's out? And uh, oddly enough, they, he was on his way out. So the, they were just <laughs> like, they just figured, well, it's an easy transition. It's just a guy called Mike. <laughs> <laughs> it's another Mike. That's yes. all we need. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, I don't know what their friction was at the time. Um, but the amp I got when I went to rehearsal in Liverpool, it had my name on it. But before I remember the amp, it just said Mike on it. And, <laughs> and, and, and Jeff Walker, being the character that he is, the comedian, he wrote Hickey on it so that Amot would see it. Like, oh, yeah, it's a tough crowd. And, uh, and, and so, you know, I basically I just learned all that stuff. And um, I did that for a while. We we kind of I'm a little older than them. We kind of had different plans. And and again, I was using my trips to England to go to work with Kronos. Yeah. And uh, the carcass thing, in the end, it didn't work out for me and them at the time. And um, I attribute that to me being 29 and them being 24 or 25. <laughs> Which seems like a, an eon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and also, those three guys were friends since they were in school. You can't, uh, yeah. and I'm American, and they're vegetarian. I'm not, uh, <laughs> you, you, you know, and I, I'm I was I'm a, I'm a little more wound up than them, and I'm a little more wild, and uh, you know, and full of myself. I was more full of myself <laughs> at the at the time, you know, and. Uh, it just didn't work out, unfortunately, because I love the band. I love those riffs. I love Bill Steers playing. Ken Owens drumming. I used to live with Ken at his flat. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, just fantastic players. Fantastic all the way around. And legendary uh, influential music, too. And it, you know, I, I hear bands, people go, oh, you got to hear this band. They're so heavy. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, I still have I still have my fifty one fifty over here from the tour. I, you know, the first oh, thing wow. I, first thing I did is made made them get me a fifty one fifty because Bill had a fifty one fifty, and I got the rented Marshall. And I was like, all right, 
Anyway, I see how this works. You know. <laughs> and I I also used to live at Bill Steer's parents' house for a while, which was very in, <laughs> very interesting. And um, you know, his, his mom was a, a teacher, I believe, and his dad was like a some kind of not a scientist, but something to do with medicinal something. Very smart people. <laughs> Shaman. And, <laughs> and, and then you know and then there's me and bill upstairs and you know we're like up there working i mean <laughs> you know <laughs> but he he you know as you know he he's a treat to listen to when he solos his vibrato is beautiful uh, and amot's fantastic too yeah. you know i mean it it another perfect storm band you know <clears throat> and and you know they after after that you know uh, I, I just really didn't do much. You know, I I just kind of I, I jammed around and and was just some kind of a guitar bum again, you know, which is fine with me, you know. <laughs> I, I think you're doing all right. Yeah, it, yeah. it works sometimes. <laughs> like I, I, I actually just saw Carcass um it was, I guess it was before the pandemic, which who who knows how many years ago that was. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but bit, like Bill, was, I, I uh, there's a nuclear assault. I think was also on the show as well, and you know, was friends with some some people at at the show. So it, like got to see uh, Bill's boat, and he had uh, I was surprised to see he had like a '61 Melody Maker. Right, and a junior or something. And a junior, and he was playing not nothing in front of the amp. It was just it was a, a newer like a EDH fifty one fifty three, but just straight in. And that that was it, and he, it sounded incredible. Yeah, he he never he or nor I at the way back. Yeah, um, <clears throat> he used a governor pedal. Okay, the the Marshall governor. Yeah, he he used the governor and he plugged straight in, at and I used the super overdrive. There was no delay, no nothing, no waz. <laughs> right. Even like even though Amot used wah wah, I didn't bring a wah and copy that. I still played yeah. like I'd kind of play his solos, but I wouldn't uh, copy the thing. And later on, I I bought a. Uh, bought a jcm 900 so i split them and and i would put chorus on one amp and that was oh. that was a wild rig for me you know <laughs> and bill was still just using the one stack and i had two half stacks and it worked good because you know what we really what we were good at what they were good at what they are good at is it's one big rhythm guitar it's yeah. not two guys i mean there are harmonies and other parts but in general when you're one once we're playing say we're playing uh embodiment or something or no love lost once we're in the groove it's one big wall of this crunchy well, guitar sorry. yeah and it's and it's a beauty you know he he really inspired me to work on my tone and get a rhythm sound that was really clear and crunchy and to this day, I mean, I still have the amp, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I still use it. And I did sell the 900, but I can put any Marshall in there right. to get my thing. And mm -hmm. uh, and I know the guy, Tom, who plays um, in Carcass now. He's British, but he lives in San Francisco. And I had him come down and visit a couple years ago, you know, before time stopped. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so I correspond with him a little bit in general and uh i you know he's a great guitar player too and i just a few months ago i i was watching him play a carcass riff on his instagram and i'm like hey buddy if you want to learn how to play that right I can <laughs> 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 so i literally i made him a video and i said no you want to play you know like you you want to finger it here you know not not up here you know and and, and you know sometimes people play in a different spot like bill bill never made me play anything specific he'd say well if that's where you're comfortable just play it there you know make it yeah. easy and th those songs i'll if you're ever learning them um 
the hard parts are actually easy and the easy parts are the hard parts you know? <laughs> so, yeah. so mike what is like something that that you've gone through on on your tours basically um a piece of gear that you would be like no matter what i have to have this this one piece of gear it could be like anything you know it's like at this point for me i i wouldn't i would need two two to three requirements and one of them is a guitar that will stay in tune <laughs> those are good i like those that's good that's a good one that's good those, those are cool with I, a hum, I, with a humbucking pickup <laughs> right all right and, that's good yeah and um then i basically would i would just need a 5150 or a high gain Marshall type amp, a Friedman or something. Um, okay. Or, and I don't need pedals. I like to have a, a, a pedal, like for just so I see the light come on and I feel like something's, you know, <laughs> something. <woo. happened. laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but I, I mean, or, you know, I, I could, I don't, I don't want a Fender Deluxe Reverb. I don't I, I don't want no. a a uh angle amp or and all that stuff's fine but I I know what will work and yes. a, a high gain Marshall obviously a Friedman brown eye is that that'll cover everything 5150 mm -hmm. I've never played a, a, a EVH uh 5153 yeah I'm sure I could get around fine with that but I feel more like nowadays, as long as I have a good uh, guitar with a good humbucker, um, the amp is what I'm really playing at this point. Yeah. yeah. And we we have a running joke, like my my rig here. Um, when my friends come over, they, they're like, if they want to hear what a guitar sounds like, they want to try it through another amp, not my rig. Because my rig <laughs> just sounds like my rig, you know. It's just one. <laughs> it's one sound for everything, you know. That's it. It could be this. It, you know, you play a telly through it, and you're like, "Yeah, it sounds the same." <laughs> <laughs> but that—that's it. That's an interesting thing too, because a lot of people are either they're they're dependent on the one guitar in particular, or some pedal setup, or like in my case, I'm dependent on the amp having that gain. You know, so that's a yeah. that's a that's a great thing to look at, at how people play, yeah. and <clears throat> I mean. I can do a gig with a high powered tweed twin, no problem, but it better be a loud gig. You know, because <laughs> that amp does that you set it to tw to 12 and that's how you run it, you know. Um, <laughs> and people overlook a, an amp like a, a high powered twin <clears throat> because it's fender based. But once you wind that sucker up, yes, it doesn't have the gain of all this other shit, right. but it has all the all the crunch. It's then it's up to you to like have some kind of yeah. ability and, um, and they're so loud. They're so damn loud. It, I mean, it's <laughs> and and you know, now you see a lot of people they have the plexiglass in front of their amps, and um, mm -hmm. now I know why. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I thought I was I thought I was loud because I was playing metal, but you know, I've I've since met some other guys throughout my career who play loud and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and i always wear earplugs anyway yeah um i hate them but i i also it's more for the symbols yeah yeah me too i have to cut the hot for me it's i have to cut those high frequencies out like I can and, take and the symbols else. are usually around ear right level right there yeah right yeah. unless we're lucky and have a drum riser <laughs> get that get that guy out of here you know <laughs> is that thing hydraulic you know just put it next to the dragon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I love it. Well, well, Mike, thank you so much for for coming on. I mean, is there anything that you want to promote? I know you've got you know your guitar <sighs> that you're doing on your Instagram. Mm -hmm. I, I you know cool. I want as as you know uh, on Instagram you have a minute to get your point across and. It's a it's a real great challenge to try and you know like I, I'm I'm about to film this guitar right yeah mm -hmm. which this this story you know goes back to my childhood and it, it could get long and <laughs> um 
so I'm going to have bullet points for this guitar and, um, you know, it's, I, I wouldn't be doing half of this stuff if it wasn't for my wife. Cause she's, I just sit around playing guitar, calling from calling my friends and talking about guitars, yeah. <laughs> and, and bitching about guitars, pissing and moaning because I can't afford a guitar. You know, I'll be, I'll be, be on the phone with Bonamassa. Did you see that flying V? Is that thing real? You know, like, <laughs> I, you know, I think the I think the tuners are changed. You know, uh, and um, this I, I'm not promoting anything except everyone should play rock guitar and rip and buy more gear and buy more amps and you know. Uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to tell you I have my new record coming out, but it's hard enough to get someone to watch a one minute video. Right. You know, so <laughs> yeah, these days. Right. And, and I, I do have a pile of music sitting on the hard drive and I'm lazy and I'm, you know, it's on my list. And, uh, you know, I've, I always, always have grand ideas of, oh, I'll get this guy to play bass. And I'm like, that's going to, I'll just grab the bass out of the closet. <laughs> there you, you, know? Go. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and, <clears throat> Uh, you know, it's just, I, I, I can't really promote anything. I just, I just, you know, like to, I like to be a positive, uh, guitar person. You know, I want to share information. I'm a, I'm interested in vintage instruments and, uh, you know, if any of your followers have original hammers, I'm interested in buying those <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and original Charvels, you know, and if you got, if you have a 59 Les Paul, I know the right people. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but before we go, I did have a question about that. Like, do, are the are the 59s and the a lot of the vintage instruments are they as horrible at staying in tune as the, the newer the new ones? ones. <laughs> uh, well, the real trick, and everybody misses this. You got to change your strings all the fucking time. Yeah. Right. So when I when I was working with Joe, I would have you know I have whatever twelve guitars to deal with, <clears throat> and we have eighteen songs, and so you know this this telly is for this song, this this guitar is for this song, this fifty nine is for these three songs, in a row, you know. So the burst, I would change the strings every day because it's going to get the most abuse. Mm -hmm. But the other guitars, I'd wait like three shows because that's like playing three songs. And mm -hmm. the real trick is to always just put them on, you know, correctly and not sauce. I, I don't know if it's placebo effect, but it, yeah. it, it helps stretch the fuck out of them, right? Mm -hmm. And... If you have the luxury of a guitar tech, make sure he's tuning the shit out of that guitar <clears throat> right up until he gives it to you, you know, and um, if you have a, a Floyd Rose, you're in better shape, right? <laughs> but uh, as you probably know, on a Floyd, sometimes the top two strings slip just a little because they're, yeah. they're, they're so thin under there. It's not going to grab them, yeah. And they, it's so ever ever but that all of a sudden that high e is like and yeah <laughs> so i mean the real trick with the les pauls is the nut you know it has to be have room for the string and yeah. sometimes factory work can be less than exemplary right um yeah i i had a, a i had a guitar delivered recently where i I finished the setup from the factory for them. You know? <laughs> right. <clears throat> and I sent it to my guy and I was like, hey, by the way, um, you might want to talk to your final setup crew about this. And he, he was mortified. And and oddly enough, this guitar had a tag with the guy's name on it. And I'm like, oh no. I'm like, who, I'm like, who's getting fired? Oh no. <laughs> I don't think they fired him, but I think they sent me sent a picture of my work to him. You know, and I hate to, I hate doing that work. You know, I've done enough of it. I'm, I'm sick of it, you know, but you know, like with the, with the Les Paul, you've got the angles 
and, and <clears throat> so you you want to have it if you look in the 50s i have a 50s les paul here um <clears throat> I'll just get rid of this. As, yeah, just get rid of that that uh, highly collectible hammer and bring out this. <laughs> this so I, I don't know if you can see this, but see how they go off on an angle? The A and the Oh, D yeah. A. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So they're already headed that way now, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> and then you add in the nut sauce. And, of course, myself and several other people, we, we top wrap it. Right, right. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So if you can see, the string is just touching the saddles. And a lot Got of it. people, <clears throat> when it goes through the normal way, it pushes on the bridge. So okay. it can, it can right. get kinked. And I mean, it's, I tuned this a few days ago. It's still there. That's yeah. crazy. Still there, yeah. And, and no issues with string tension on on the, the saddles themselves no like, it's it's it. it's just enough power to hold it on there you know i, I mean i can pull it off for, forcibly yeah mm -hmm. but and still in tune <laughs> oh wow okay <laughs> that's great. Uh, so out of the factory were they slotting the nuts already off, like angling off to an angle and um got it you know there is a I'm going to call it a minor flaw with the 50s Les Paul, but if you look closely here, you'll see the the low E string and the A string they're they're touching oh, here. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so I can I can make it, you know, bind. So you just have to make sure it's kind of like the A string's a little bit above the E string and you tune the mm. A string after the E string anyway, right? So but they they stay in tune pretty good. I I would say uh, good for three songs before you got to give it back to the dude, you know? And <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, if you can afford a million dollar guitar, you can have a dude too. You got the dude, yeah. <laughs> and and I mean, with the, the nuts slotted like that, I mean, that's easily worth a million dollars. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I mean, in these tuners, these are 50s tuners. I didn't change them or anything. You didn't change yeah. the tuners either. So no. Much, yeah. No, and so I mean, it's just basically, you know, they they figured some good shit out back then, you know, old old Ted McCarty and old Leo Fender, those two guys really, you know, everything we do now, minus this these headless things that are, you know, with crooked frets and shit, Mon I, monstrosities. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I get dizzy, you know. It it's like the 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 true temper like true temper or, or the fans or yeah yeah the fan like uh and, and then you see you yeah. know, these, these young these young lads are out there and they're like la, 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 and you're like what the hell yeah i, I stop at six strings seven gets <laughs> yeah yeah me too you know uh, I, it's and, just and, it's a headache it really <laughs> is it. i mean <laughs> and and think about like how many? Well, I only have these fingers. How much? What do I need eight strings for? Yeah, yeah. You know? And 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 how low do you want to? You know, when I when I joined Cathedral, they were tuned to A. So I begged them after the <laughs> after the first gig. I'm like, guys, could we just go up a step, just to B? And we did, and it made all the difference. Like, so when you get to uh, Ethereal Mirror. Yeah, that's in B. Yeah, yeah. The other albums are in A. And okay, when I learned those songs, I used the Dan Electro uh, short scale bass that I tuned an octave up with guitar oh. strings. That's how I learned all the songs with guitar strings because I couldn't yeah, at hear. At that point, I was like, just get a yeah. baritone at that. You know, it's like yeah, it's like, yeah. <laughs> and you know, with car carcass are in B. Yeah, and um. Thankfully, Bill did some experimenting to get the tension right on the strings with the Floyd, you know, so when I came in, I was able to, uh, like, just absorb what he already had figured yeah. out, you know, and, uh, you know, we always use 12 through 54, I think, with an unwound third. Right. Because we're playing, know. we're playing lead, you know. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. We're 54 not, even sounds kind of kind of small. You had no problems with the. Uh, 
Uh, what did we do? We did 12, 16, 22, 34, 42, 54, I think it was. And sometimes we'd use 56. Okay. Okay. And, um, and I remember telling the guys at Diodario that you should market a set for down tuning. And they're like, they're all <laughs> over the place now. Right. Yeah. yeah. They're like, they're like, oh, this, this stuff, this is not going to catch on. And I can also remember a, a guitar company we were associated with telling me, I, I'm like, you know, we got, we, we should market this thing for this kind of music. And they're like, mm -hmm. you want, you want to head in a more melodic direction. <laughs> and, and now look, now look at all these guys. Right. <laughs> Just amazing. Yeah. But yeah. I could go on for days. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, we, we, we've, we've kept you for a while. And thank you again so much. Yeah, well, yeah, thank, thank you, you guys. I, thank you, Mike. I, Appreciate it. If I ever if I ever get a, a podcast, I'll have you guys come on. And, and oh, yeah. <laughs> we'd love to. And we'll, and we'll turn the tables on you. <laughs> we, Appreciate we it. Be, uh, we can be the, what is it, Walter and uh, who are the, the Muppet? Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, the well, guys, in the, guys in the balcony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the grumpy old man. <laughs> grumpy old why, am man. I, why am I forgetting their names? Oh, oh. But well, anyway, I'll, awesome. I'll come to me afterwards when I when I walk away. But awesome. Well, thank you, gents. I appreciate thank it. Much. It was, Thanks, Mike. Appreciate right. it. We'll Bye. see you soon. Take Talk care. Bye.